Schizoid Creator In the private laboratory, which his practice as a psychiatrist had enabled him to build, equip, and maintain, Dr. Carlos Morena had completed certain preparations that were hardly in accord with the teachings of modern science. For these preparations, he had drawn instruction from old grimoires bequeathed by ancestors who had incurred the fatherly wrath of the Spanish Inquisition. According to a rather scurrilous family legend, other ancestors had been numbered among the Inquisitors. At the end of the long room, he had cleared the cluttered floor of its equipment, leaving only an immense globe of crystal glass that suggested an aquarium. About the globe, he had traced with a consecrated knife the sorcerer's Arthame, a circle inscribed with pentagrams and the various Hebrew names of the deity. Also at a distance of several feet, a smaller circle similarly inscribed. Wearing a seamless and sleeveless robe of black, he stood now within the smaller protective circle. Upon his breast and forehead was bound the double triangle, wrought perfectly from several metals. A silver lamp engraved with the same sign afforded the sole light shining on a stand beside him. Aloes, camphor, and storax burned in censers set about him on the floor. In his right hand he held the arthame, in his left a hazel staff with a core of magnetized iron. Like Dr. Faustus, Moreno designed an evocation of the devil but not, however, for the same purpose that had inspired Faustus. Pondering long and gravely on the painful mysteries of the cosmos, the discrepancy of good and evil, Moreno had at last conceived an explanation that was startlingly simple. There could, he reasoned, be only one creator, God, who was or had been primarily benignant. Yet all the evidence pointed to the coexistence of an evil creative principle, a Satan. God then must be a split or dual personality, a sort of Jekyll and Hyde, manifesting sometimes as the devil. This duality, Moreno argued, must be a form of what is commonly called schizophrenia. He had a profound belief in the efficacy of shock treatment for such disorders. If God, in his aspect as the devil, could be suitably confined and subjected to treatment, a cure might result. The confused problems of the universe would then resolve themselves under a sane and no longer semi-diabolic deity. The glass globe, specially constructed at great expense, contained at one side electrical apparatus of Moreno's own devising, the machine, far more complex than the portable apparatus used in electric shock treatment, could release a voltage powerful enough to electrocute simultaneously all the inmates of a state prison. Moreno considered that no lesser force could affect the shock necessary for the cure of a supernatural personage. He had memorized an ancient spell for the calling up of the devil and his confinement within a bottle. The globe would do admirably for the aforesaid bottle. The spell was a bastard mixture of Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Its exact meaning seemed doubtful. It was filled with such terms as Eloha, Tentragrammaton, Kis, Elojon, Elohim, Sade, and Zebaoth, the names of God. The word Bifrons recurred several times. This was no doubt one of the devil's numerous names, but there could be only one devil. Moreno disregarded as childish those old demonologies that peopled hell with a multitude of evil spirits, having each his own name, rank, and office. All then was in readiness. In a firm, sonorous voice, which might have been that of a priest chanting the Mass, he began to recite the incantation. When the summons came, Bifrons was busily engaged in amorous dalliance with the she-imp Foti. Like Janus, he was two-faced, and he possessed multiple members. Since Foti herself was somewhat peculiarly formed, their lovemaking was quite complicated. Bifrons began to withdraw his members from about the she-imp, explaining, Some damned sorcerer has gotten hold of that ancient spell containing my name. It's the first time in two hundred years. But I'll have to go. Hurry back enjoined Foti, pouting with her four lips, two of which were located in her abdomen. If you don't, you may find me otherwise occupied. The air sizzled behind Bifrons in his exit from the infernal regions. 
Dr. Moreno felt surprised and even appalled when he saw the being that his incantation had called up in the globe. He had scarcely known what to expect, and it paid little attention to old pictures and descriptions of the devil, seeing in them only the dementia of medieval superstition. But the teratology of this creature seemed incredible. The two faces of Bifrons bloated alternately against the globe's interior, and his arms, legs, body, and numerous other parts squirmed and flattened themselves convulsively in a furious effort to escape. But through the thickness of the glass, or the power of the surrounding circle, Bifrons was bottled up as helplessly as any dingin imprisoned by Solomon. He resigned himself presently and began to relax, floating a while in midair and finally seating himself on Moreno's electrical machine. As if feeling more at home, he looped some of his parts around the various pairs of forceps, ending in electrodes that projected from the huge and intricate device. What the devil do you want? he bellowed. The glass muffled his voice, which was still sufficiently audible. His tones bespoke anger and resentment. I want the devil said Moreno, and I presume that you are he? The devil? queried Bifrons. It's true that I'm a devil, but I'm not the old man himself. There are many thousands of us, as you should know if you've read the demonologists. I'm no infernal prince, but merely a subordinate, though with special powers of my own. Again, what do you want? Money? Women? A senatorship? The presidency of your cockeyed republic? Name it, and I'll grant the wish. I'm in a hellish hurry to get out of here. You can't fool me. I know that you are the devil, the only one in the universe, and I don't want any of your gifts. All I want is to cure you. Bifrons was startled. Cure me? Of what? Say, what kind of sorcerer are you, anyway? I'm not a sorcerer, but a psychiatrist. My name is Dr. Moreno. My hope and intention is to cure you of being the devil. This madhouse doctor must be crazy himself, thought Bifrons. He cogitated. The trend of his cogitations was betrayed only by a sardonic one-sided twist of his left-hand mouth. All right, I'm the devil, he agreed finally, but let's get this over with. What do you mean to do with me? Subject you to shock treatment, announced the doctor. A very special high-voltage treatment. It should be the best thing for schizophrenia like yours. Schizo what? roared Bifrons. Do you think I'm a lunatic? Let me explain. I'm using the term schizophrenia in its literal sense, meaning split personality, not as commonly applied to several types of psychic disintegration or regression. I think that you are really a sick deity. Your illness consists in being Satan part of the time, a genuine case of dual and alternating egos. The satanic self dominates at present, otherwise I shouldn't have been able to call you up, but we'll soon remedy all that. The demon thought it well to conceal his consternation. He must get back to hell as soon as possible and make a report. Satan, he felt, would be interested in Dr. Moreno. Get on with your treatment, he enjoined. What is it, anyway? Electricity. Bifrons assumed an expression of double-faced dismay. That's a highly dangerous and destructive force. Do you wish to annihilate me? The result should be different in your case, said the doctor in his most soothing professional voice. Are you ready? Bifrons gave a bicephalic nod. Moreno stepped cautiously from the circle and went over to a panel of switches and levers set in the laboratory wall. Watching the demon closely, he began to manipulate one of the levers. The numerous forceps of the machine on which Bifrons had so conveniently seated himself closed themselves on various parts of his anatomy, applying their electrodes to his skin. A pair hitherto concealed sprang forth and seized his temples tightly. Moreno grasped the switch firmly and turned on the full voltage. Then, still cautious, he returned to the protective circle. A shower of sparks and short blue bolts issued from the machine within the globe. In spite of the many forceps that had tightened upon him, Bifrons writhed and tossed like a harpooned octopus. Smoke seemed to pour from his head, body, and members, muffling the apparatus that held him captive. Soon a dark brown cloud, seething and swelling, had filled the globe's interior, concealing everything from view. The cloud was something that Bifrons could emit at will, like the fluid of a cuttlefish. As a matter of fact, since his nature was itself electrical, he had absorbed the terrific voltage with merely a mild discomfort. The dark cloud was a necessary screen for the tactics that he now intended to use. 
Perhaps, Moreno thought, the treatment had been sufficiently prolonged. He could repeat it if necessary. Emerging once more from his magic shelter, he turned off the switch and reversed the lever that had served to manipulate the forceps. Once again, he went back to the circle. After an interval of silence, there issued from the clouded globe a voice which had no resemblance to that of Bifron's. It was both thunderous and mellow. To Moreno's inexperienced ear, it sounded like the voice that spoke to Moses on the mountain. I am cured, it announced. You have restored me to my divinity, O wise and beneficent doctor. Pronounce the formula of release and let me go. Hell is henceforth abolished, together with all evil sin and disease. The devil is dead. God alone exists, and God is good. Moreno was enraptured, believing that he had realized so quickly his fondest professional hope. Scarcely knowing what he did, he uttered the formula that served to release an imprisoned spirit. Afterwards, he asked, Now, will you reveal yourself to me? I would behold you in all your glory. It cannot be, the voice thundered. My glory would blast your eyes forever. Therefore, the cloud with which I have surrounded myself. A moment later, the globe burst asunder in flying fragments like some gigantic bottle of new champagne. The released cloud, billowing vastly and voluminously, seemed to overspread the whole laboratory in an instant. Bifrons, raging behind it but still invisible, proceeded to wreck all of Moreno's equipment like a dozen baboons gone berserk. Tray-laden tables were overturned and smashed into splinters. Shelves were pulled down with a crashing of countless vials and carboys. Coiled tubings were twisted and bent and ripped apart. Heavily insulated wires snapped like twine. The old volumes of magic piled in a corner sprang into flame and burned to ashes in a few seconds. A violent wind coming as if from nowhere took up the ashes and scattered them throughout the room. Moreno, protected by the circle, alone escaped the demon's wrath. He crouched at the circle's center, cowering and gibbering while the cloud passed away through windows from which every pane had been broken. Several of his colleagues coming to consult him that evening found him still crouching on the wreckage-littered floor. He did not seem to recognize them, and had obviously become deranged. His mouthings appeared to indicate a sort of theological mania. The colleagues held an impromptu consultation of their own. As a result, Moreno was removed gently but forcibly to the same type of institution as that to which he had committed so many of his patients. His friends and fellow psychiatrists deplored the interruption— perhaps the ending of an illustrious career. The wrecking of the laboratory remained a mystery. Had there been an explosion caused by one of Moreno's experiments? Had the doctor himself destroyed his equipment in a state of violent mania? Or should the occurrence be classified as an act of God? Fuming at the interruption of his tryst with Foti, Bifrons nevertheless thought it incumbent upon himself to report at once to Satan when he returned to the nether realms. He found the master of that picturesque region occupied in caressing a half-flayed girl. The flaying had been done to render the caresses more intimate and more exquisitely agonizing. Satan listened gravely to the demon's account of Dr. Moreno, his tapering artistic fingers with long pointed nails of polished jet ceased their occupation, and a furrow appeared like a black triangle between his luminous marble brows. This is all very interesting, and rather unfortunate, he said. However, you have acted with admirable aplomb and presence of mind. The situation should be well under control as long as Moreno remains in the madhouse, where you and his colleagues have landed him. He paused, and his fingers resumed in an absent-minded fashion there, gentle raking of his victim's lumbar regions. Of course, as you understand, Moreno was quite mad from the start. But lunatics with a speculative bent can sometimes stumble overly close to certain guarded cosmic secrets, and there are spells which even I must answer and obey, not to mention the unspeakable name the Shem Hamforash, which coerces and compels Jehovah. 
after he recovers from his present state of shock, Moreno might be adjudged sane and released to continue his researches and experiments. Such an eventuation must be forestalled, permanently. My good Bifrons, you must return immediately to Earth and watch over him. I have full trust in your abilities, and I confer upon you plenipotentiary powers. All I ask is that you keep this doctor well bedeviled and legally insane until the hour of his death. When Bifrons departed, Satan summoned his chief lieutenants before him in the halls of Pandemonium. I am going away for a while, he told them. There are certain obligations of a pressing nature that call me, and I must not neglect them too long. In my absence, I consign the management of hell to your competent hands. Bowing reversely, Gorson, Goop, Zimamar, and Amimon, lords of the four quarters, went out one after one, leaving their prince alone. When they had gone, he descended from his globed throne and passed through many corridors and by many upward-winding stairs to the small postern door of hell. The door swung open without touch of any visible hand. A long white robe seemed to weave itself swiftly from the air about Satan's form. His infernal attributes withered and dropped away, and the long white beard of Elohim sprouted and flowed down over his bosom as he stepped across the sill into heaven.